Good evening. I call this Dunwoody City Council meeting on September 6th at 6 p.m. to order. Um, unless there's an objection from council, seeing none, this meeting is called to order. Councilman Seconder, can you please lead us in the invocation and the pledge? At this meeting, help us to make decisions which keep us faithful to our mission and reflect our values. Give us strength to hold to our purpose, wisdom to guide us, and a keen perception to lead us. And above all, keep us charitable as we deliberate. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Chief. Good evening, Mayor and Council. It's my pleasure tonight to introduce two new officers. I would ask them if they'd come forward at this time. It'd be great. All right. Uh, first, we have Officer Daryl Moses. Uh, he has recently been employed at Petco as a merchandise operations specialist. And prior to that, he worked in member services at UCF Recreation and Wellness Center. He holds a bachelor's degree in political science from the University of Central Florida. He joined our department on May 19th, and uh, both he and Jessica just graduated Friday from the uh, police academy. So we're happy to have him here. Then we have Jessica Preston. Uh, Jessica has most recently been employed by Northside Hospital as a paramedic. Uh, prior to that, she was employed as a fire medic for Gwinnett County Fire and EMS. We're excited to have both of them on our team. Thank you. All right, I'm coming down. Okay. Thank y'all. All right, if you'll please raise your right hand. On my honor, I, on my honor, I, state your name, yeah. Jessica Preston, do solemnly swear and affirm that, do solemnly swear and affirm that, I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States of America. I will, I will support, support and, and defend the Constitution, Constitution of the United States of America. The Constitution of the State of Georgia. The Constitution of the State of Georgia. And the Charter and Ordinances of the City of Dunwoody, Georgia. And the Charter and Ordinances of the City of Dunwoody, Georgia. I am not the holder of any unaccounted for public money. I am not the holder of any accounted for public money. Due to this state or any political subdivision or authority thereof. Due to this state or any political subdivision or authority thereof. I am not the holder of any office of trust under the government of the United States. I am not the holder of any office of trust under the government of the United States. Any other state or any foreign state which I am. Any other state or any foreign state which I am. By the laws of the state of Georgia prohibited from holding. By the laws of the state of Georgia prohibited from holding. I am otherwise qualified to hold the office of a peace officer. I am otherwise qualified to hold the office of a peace officer. According to the Constitution and laws of the state of Georgia. According to the Constitution and laws of the state of Georgia. I will faithfully follow the legal rules, regulations, policies. I will faithfully follow the legal rules, regulations, policies. And procedures of the Dunwoody Police Department in the city of Dunwoody, Georgia. And procedures of the Dunwoody Police Department in the city of Dunwoody, Georgia. Congratulations. Thank you all very much. We're very glad that you are here, and I think we're going to take a few pictures. Yeah. Okay. 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 Okay
like two kids. Right? Seven more years. Your family member be my family member for two years? Um, before everyone takes off, and thank you all to everyone from the Dunwoody Police Department that is in the back of the room coming out to support Officers Moses and Preston, we want to welcome you here. This is a community that values our police department and the members of our police department, and we are so grateful that you chose Dunwoody, and we hope the, we know the academy went well. I've seen you around bits and pieces before you start it. Um, and we are so grateful that you are going to be here, and there are a handful of citizens here tonight, um, but the community looks forward to welcoming you and greeting you and making you part of our family. So thank you very much for choosing Dunwoody, and always let any of us know up here if there's anything we can do. So once again, thank you and congratulations. And thank you all members of the Dunwoody Police Department for all you do for our community. Thank you. Public comments, you will have um, three minutes. Um, if you're here and you haven't filled out a card to speak and you'd like to, um, you can fill it out and drop it off. Um, but otherwise, I will start with Tom Simon. Just introduce yourself and you'll have three minutes. Uh, Tom Simon, Stevens Walk, Mayor and Council, thank you for the invite. Uh, I started thinking about three minutes, and there's no way I can put in three minutes what I want to say. I have an email that I'll be going out to all of you, as well as everyone on the uh, Stevens Walk neighborhoods, I'm sorry, the east side of Tilly Mill neighborhoods, as well as uh, three or four of the uh, media. I've already been interviewed by one media. And I've got another one set up for tomorrow or Thursday. Uh, I'm representing the Stevens Walk as well as some of the neighborhoods. Uh, I just want to show a couple of pictures. This picture, can you see it? Oh, where is it? How do you see it? You can share it with Sharon afterwards. That's probably easier. Okay, okay. This shows what is going to be destroyed at the two entrances to Stevens Walk. All the trees, shrubs, everything, as well as the deceleration lanes. This is the sheet that Michael Smith gave Jeff Levine and myself showing the numbers on the west side and the east side of Tiller Mill, the traffic, they really have no basis in reality because Michael could not explain any of the numbers where he got the numbers from. Uh, and lastly, um, I know I listened to the 613-22 council meeting and I've given you all the other reasons before. But I did listen to, uh, I know Rob Price, who represents the west side of Tilly Mill and the, and the JCC, and you are for the multi-use path being on the east side. What I can't understand is Tom Lambert, who represents us on the east side of Tilly Mill, also wants the multi-use path on the east side of Tilly Mill, even with all the damage, destruction, additional $700,000 in cost, 336 trees being cut down and killed, erosion and flooding that could take place, and all the other reasons I used. Uh, I'm just I'm just blown away by by that. Any case, uh, that's my uh, that's my speech tonight, and I will be sending an email out that you all be getting. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hirsch. Next, I'm sorry, Mr. Simon. Next up is Mr. Joe Hirsch. Hi, Joe Hirsch. Uh, I wish the mayor were here, but uh, I wanted to share actually thanking her in a rare moment. I know uh, sh she should be here, but um, I, as you all know, I read a lot of text messages that are sent out, and I was glad to see that she was uh, text messaging a council member reminding that person uh, not to send out emails that discuss policy issues um, and that that was forbidden. And she reminded this council member not to do that. And so I appreciate that. And then had to follow up in that same 
text message that she was sending, uh, reminding them that even in a car ride, that council member should not be doing that. So I thank the mayor for doing that. And um, I hope that the rest of y'all that didn't apply to or those that it does apply to know the rules as far as open meetings. Um, my next comments are uh, specifically for Mayor Lynn, Eric Clinton, Richard McLeod, Shane Peoples, Valerie Hicks, and Sharon Helm. And I just wanted to uh, share this. They'll know what it is and they will hopefully respond accordingly. So these are my thoughts. It's kind of annoying after a while, doesn't it? I wish I could go for more than three minutes. Keeps going. I can come back later and play it again if anyone wants me to. Thank you, Mr. Hirsch. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Mr. Ryan Esslinger. Evening, Mayor and Council. I just sent this email to you about a couple hours ago. I'm just going to read it verbatim for, uh, for public record. Mayor and Council, my name is Ryan Esslinger, and my wife and I are current residents and property owners at 1416 Womack Road the White House in which the tree fell, now which is subject to a lot of debate uh, due to construction project. Uh, since moving into our home in October 2014, we have experienced a number of issues with the city of Dunwoody's overall lack of response and resolution to several outstanding items and concerns we brought forth dating back to 2015. These include, but are not limited to, maintenance of grounds on Dunwoody Library property adjacent to our property, including excess water runoff, soil disruption, lack of removal of non-native invasive plant species and vegetation, disease and decaying trees, and lack of a recent tree survey for the property. The last one was done in 2012 for Spruill. A general neglect of the property in terms of uh, right-of-way maintenance and uh, tree services and, and lawn services, as well as most recently the Shambly Dunwoody Road, Womack Road intersection improvement project, quite a scene going on over there. Uh, there's improper storage of construction and earth materials, both on my private property as well as in the public right of way. Repeated silt, silt fence failures three times now, uh, resulting in an improper water and waste runoff, resulting in litter and mud discharge on my property in the public right of way. On behalf of my family, we're begging you to please step up and address these issues with us. We've come to city council meetings, voiced our concerns uh, on more than one occasion over the years, pre-COVID, pre-planning for this project, as well as other issues. We have written to many of you, talked to many of you personally. We have submitted comments for public input. We have logged six C-click fix tickets. We have been extremely vocal about our concerns, as have many of our neighbors, especially recently. My family and I love our home, our city and our property. We've had to share our hardships, our share of hardships within our home and property recently. The combination of water runoff and high winds in October, 2020 led to that beautiful white oak tree falling on our house. 
Thankfully, it only clipped the front gable wall, but it was still a $60,000 insurance claim. Uh, there was some emotional trauma endured that for my young children. Uh, it wasn't exactly a fun ride for my wife and I either. Since January 2021, we've been patiently waiting for this Shamley Dunwoody Road Womack intersection improvement project to come to fruition, fully anticipating we would be the residents most impacted by this project. We kindly ask the city and its stakeholders to remediate the known issues addressed above and follow up with us in greater detail regarding these issues by no later than September 16th, the end of next week. We believe this to be more than reasonable given the impact to our home and the overall timeline since communicating concerns with the city dating back to 2015. We're just simply asking you, all of you to please be good neighbors, do your part to help make our property and dwelling safe, functional, aesthetically pleasing and enjoyable for our family and the community. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next up, we have Mr. Bob Hickey. Mr. Hickey, you have three minutes once you get to the podium. Uh, Council, I uh, appreciate your time tonight. My name is Bob Hickey. I'm a resident and citizen of Dunwoody for over 45 years. I'm here tonight to follow up on a previous uh, comment that I've made about the illegal and unsafe firearms that the city once had in their possession. And you may recall, this goes back to the July 25th city council meeting in which it was first published that the city had 66 guns that they were going to sell. Uh, I objected to that. I said those guns were eight, uh, eight of them, have no serial numbers on them and are clearly illegal to sell in any manner. And there are over 20 of them that are unsafe because they're very small guns that could be easily hidden in backpacks for school kids to take, book bags, back pockets, or otherwise. So they're clearly unsafe. And I have I have no resolution as to what the city has done with those illegal and unsafe firearms. I'm actually very disappointed that the policemen who were here earlier for this two new policemen sworn in tonight are not here tonight to hear what I have to say because their police chief is clearly not backing them. They are permitting, the police chief is permitting illegal and unsafe guns back on the streets of Dunwoody. Somebody could get hurt or killed because these illegal and unsafe guns are out on the street. And somebody will be held accountable if that happens. Uh, I've been given the flimsy excuse that state law doesn't permit the city to destroy that. And that's clearly not true. I have a copy of the state ordinance here and it, it says the, the police chief can certify that a if a firearm is unsafe or if it's prohibited by any federal or state law, then at the discretion of the police chief, they can be turned over to the division of forensic scientists of the state of Georgia and be destroyed, be destroyed. I ask you one, I've asked you several times for you to do the right thing and get these guns destroyed as they should be. Okay. They should be taken out of the hands of the public. Okay. They should be destroyed. So I'm asking you again tonight. Okay. What is the status of these illegal and unsafe guns? Okay. Are they still in the hands of the city or they have they been illegally sold? Okay. With the city. Trans transferring these guns illegally. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hickey. That concludes public comment. Is there anybody in the audience that uh, wanted to speak but has not had the opportunity to give us their white card? Seeing none, we will move off public comment. Uh, next up is a reports and presentations, a re city manager's report, Mr. Lindbergh. Yes, sir, thank you. Um, let me get that right here. We have in the within the police department, we have some upcoming events. We have coffee with a cop is scheduled for Tuesday, September 13th from 8 to 10 a.m. at the Chick-fil-A at Perimeter. Um, also on September the 20th from 6:30 to 8, the department will host uh, death by overdose, where staff will discuss the national epidemic of um, overdose, and it will be here at City Hall. Also, we had uh, detectives participated in a operation cross country with the FBI, which is a national in a, um, initiative combating human trafficking. <clears throat> the department made 37 arrests, including three for pimping, and several cases are being reviewed further for possible trafficking. 
national press released a video and the FBI highlighted the work of the Dunwoody Police Department during that time. Also uh, on um, August the 4th, officers with the CRT conducted a distracted driving detail on Mount Vernon Road at Shamley Dunwoody Road and 17 traffic citations were issued. <clears throat> also within the report, you'll notice numerous other incidents, which I will not go into detail with, but they are part of your report and part of the public record. Also within the public works um, department, as it was mentioned earlier, we are working on the Shamley Dunwoody at Womack intersection, and we're hoping to get that, that portion completed soon so we can get um, finish that up and, and um, get that project outside of the, um, the public's way. Um, parks, upcoming events. We have October 1, the Hispanic Heritage and Dunwoody Arts and Cultural Month celebration. October the 8th, Grooving on the Green series finale. October 27th, Trunk or Treat. We also have our Veterans Day ceremony on November the 11th. And our holiday lights opening night will be on December the 1st. So several items to mark on your calendar. They have, we also have the new programs are secured for the fall and winter leaf, including babysitter boot camp, pet CPR and first aid, Atlanta ballet and hip hop, and kilometer kids with Atlanta track club. The, uh, the bathroom, which is a, a CXT bathroom for Waterford Park project that we've signed that contract and the manufacturing delivery of the building is scheduled for December. We've also subcontracted the plumbing electrical for the pad there. Within our community development department, High Street development is continuing with, with their build out. Also campus 244 continues with the permit for the parking deck um, and hotel was issued and construction is expected to begin soon there. Work also continues at Ashford Lane with the pedestrianized street section largely completed. The department completed 687 building inspections since the last report and the staff conducted 137 code enforcement inspections, including 12 vacant properties, two stop work orders, 17 warnings and 17 citations. Under economic development, we have our Edge City 2.0 planning process to create a shared economic vision for perimeter in the Dunwoody commercial market. September 22nd is a stakeholder advisory council meeting. October 20th is the public open house. We also have under marketing, we have our um, developing a communication plan with GDOT on the 285 lane closures. GDOT has committed to, uh, to giving us um, 30 days notice before that goes into play. We also have under municipal court, we've disposed of over 511 cases and reset 31 cases. And that concludes my report. I, along with the staff, are happy to answer any questions council may have on this. Okay, uh, Catherine, do you have any questions? Yes, thanks, Eric. Just one about the Spalding Drive detour, because you say that's going to start in September in the report. Do you have a date and are we gonna get it done ways? Right, on that, I don't have an exact date on that. We will have, um, that will be a full detour in that area on Spalding Drive, which will cut around to Shamley Dunwoody and Dunwoody Road um, for that storm pipe that has to be installed. We're still working on getting the final materials for that and careful construction alignment. And what I mean by that is we have to go through under a couple of major water lines in that area. When I say major lines, these are city of Atlanta water lines that serve the north side uh, Pill Hill area. And so we wanna be sure that that's done in great coordination and move very rapidly through there. But I was, originally we were told the middle of September was when we would start that. So I'm gonna hold that date and, and uh, we'll have an update at the next council meeting if anything changes. Okay, that's it, thank you. Stacy, go ahead. Yeah, it's oh, right now. Okay. Um, this is just a question in regards to Operation Cross Country. Um, it says that we were able to arrest three pimps. 
which is amazing. I want to know if the reason why we could do it is because the ordinance changed that we did last year. The ordinance change certainly helped in that, yes. And again, I would just encourage our fellow and neighboring cities to follow our ordinance so that they can do the same. Anybody else have questions? Joe. Um, thank you for our police for watching out for that Dunwoody bear. Appreciate <laughs> you keeping that out on, on, on the on media on the lookout. But I did see somebody get a photo of that, that guy. So anyway, no news is good news on that one. Um, and we've got some EV charging stations we've been putting in recently, right, um, right. Eric? Um, yes, sir. Well, it's over the library, and then um, Jay probably knows the other locations. We're yeah, he, he can, you know. sort of get, and we also have some coming right here at City Hall Excellent. as well that are going in. And those, um, you know, those are a paid, uh, you know, pay per use service, and that was a, through an agreement that we have uh, with with the company where they put them in, and of course they reap the benefits of the of anybody who uses those. But it's at risk for them if you know, of course, if nobody uses those. But yes, we're trying to. Of course, that's a more of a futuristic, futuristic. Of course, one of our council members has an electric vehicle, so hopefully mm -hmm. she can use those as well. Yeah. But it is, um, it is a way of the future on the electric cars. No, absolutely. I thank thank you for putting that in. And again, we're investing in the future, looking future focused. I think what twenty thirty five that potentially one of the largest states in the nation may be just having exclusively sales right. of, of electric motor vehicles. So. There's issues about people saying, oh, I, I, I can only drive so far. I can't charge. You know, the market's getting that, right? We're building new batteries, having new capacity, but having those charging stations is definitely uh, definitely great for the community. And and the new businesses are doing them, you know, right. organically as well. So thank you. John, you have any questions? No questions. Anybody down here? I just wanted to point out something just is, it's an oversight, I think, but September 18th is actually when we're celebrating Hispanic Cultural Month. It's at the library. I think it starts at one o'clock. Um, I know you, you sure. gave they gave you the last quarter of the year things. And then also there's a concert this Saturday night at Brook Run. So thank you. And it's six, ten, six o'clock, I think. So all right, thank you. And we will move on. If any, unless anybody has any other questions, seeing none, we'll move on to the consent agenda. Does anybody have any questions or comments or concerns about the consent agenda? Move to approve. Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 And I want to recognize um, that we have a new member of the Scover Dunwoody, which I always want to say is CBB because that's what it is, but that's what we call our CBB, um, and Stephanie Cantwell. And so if you're watching, I don't think she's here. Is she here? I don't see her. If you're watching at home, thank you very much for agreeing to serve. Next, uh, I think Sharon, you have to read this because we're into resolutions now, or do you want us to talk about it? Because are there two different resolutions here? There are, Mayor, we prepared two. Um, so should we discuss it first and then, then you can them. read the correct resolution? So council, Brent, you wanna take it away? Sure. We should be able to figure this one out. Yeah, so uh, at the uh, August 22nd meeting, if y'all remember, I brought the part naming, uh, item for the three park properties at that time for Vermont Road, Roberts Drive, and the new park at Perimeter Center East. Uh, through that discussion, we we whittled it down to just the one park at Perimeter Center East. Uh, from that meeting, uh, Councilwoman Lautenbacher and I met. Uh, we also sent the list to the city arborist and got some input from her. Uh, we whittled it down even more to eight names uh, that were on the list for Perimeter Center East. Those names went out in a straw poll to you guys, uh, it came back that there were two uh, top runners of Iron Bridge Park mm -hmm. and Two Bridges Park for the property at Burma Center East. Uh, those are the, the two front runners with Creekside Park coming in uh, third place. So tonight uh, it is open for y'all to decide uh, between the two names of uh, Two Bridges or Ironside, I'm sorry, not Ironside, that's a boat, Iron mm -hmm. Bridge Park, uh, if y'all so choose. Uh, at that point, we will read the resolution in and naming the park. Okay, so my suggestion is, is is just to vote unless someone has a strong argument for either. I mean, just to, a casual vote because we're not a business item. Joe wants to flip a coin, but but does anyone have a strong opinion about one that they want to make an argument about? Okay, so the two names were two bridges, I, two, 
and yeah, Iron Bridge Park. Park. So if you're in favor, this is like a casual vote, but if you're in favor of Two Bridges Park, raise your hand. So that's four. <laughs> Catherine? All right, um, if you're, and we probably should have, no, you cannot vote twice. And then Iron Bridge Park, raise your hand. So it's very close, but it's Two Bridge Park. So thank you. Two bridges. Two bridges. Two bridges. Two bridges. You're right. Two bridges. Sorry. Bridge. No. <laughs> no. Two bridges park. Okay. So and it's true. done. And it's not East Perimeter Center East Park, Catherine. So you should feel victorious either way. All right. So now we need to read the appropriate resolution, please. Okay. That's fine. Yeah. A resolution naming the park property located at 50 Perimeter Center East, Two Bridges Park. Whereas the city has the responsibility to, to enhance the sense of community through naming of city parks, recreational areas, streets, roads, and facilities. And whereas the proper naming of a park ensures recreational areas are easily identified and located. And whereas the names given to city assets are consistent with the values, mission, and characteristics of the city of Dunwoody. And whereas the city wishes to encourage public participation and input in order to fully represent the best interests of the asset or area affected. And whereas a park facility may be named after an outstanding feature of the area. Now, th now therefore be it resolved by the mayor and council for the city of Dunwoody that the property located at 50 Perimeter Center East shall hereafter be officially named Two Bridges Park. Thank you. Move to approve. Moved by John. Second. Second by Catherine. All, any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries unanimously. We have a name. Thank you very much. Sharon, do you need to do you need us to take a technology break? Because we can if we need to pause. Okay. The next item is a resolution of the Mayor and City Council of the City of Dunwoody, Georgia, creating a Citizen Advisory Capital Improvements Committee. Whereas the City of Dunwoody is authorized by the City Charter to create boards, commissions, and authorities as a Mayor and City Council deem necessary. And whereas the Mayor and City Council wish to create a Citizen Advisory Capital Improvements Committee, and whereas the Citizen Advisory Capital Improvements Committee shall be a temporary committee charged with responsibility of reviewing Dunwoody's capital improvements needs and providing input and recommendations to the Mayor and City Council regarding capital needs and projects. And whereas the Mayor, with confirmation from City Council, desires to appoint the following citizens to serve as members of the Citizen Advisory Capital Improvements Committee. Remy Bullard, Steve Ellett, Sue Ellis, Brian G., Max Lehman, Abby Les, Les Organ, Joe Martinez, Marika Smith, Sarah Smith. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the mayor of the city of Dunwoody hereby appoints Remy Bullard, Steve Ellett, Sue Ellis, Brian G., Max Lehman, Abby Les Organ, Joe Martinez, Marika Smith, and Sarah Smith to serve on the Citizen Advisory Capital Improvements Committee. Thank you all for sending names. Um, and does anybody have any questions? So this will be a time limited publicly advertised committee. They'll meet for six weeks between now and the middle of December, twice in September. It'll be Wednesdays at the September 14th is the first Wednesday. At 6 p.m. 6 p.m. 6 to 7 30. Each meeting will have an agenda. And a topic, Councilman Lambert is serving as ex officio and will lead the discussion. And we're asking um, the members of this committee to review our list. We're not talking about finances. We're not talking about bonds. We are talking about what capital projects we've looked into and what also might be missing. Um, and we look forward to the feedback from this committee. Does anyone have any other questions? Seeing none. And, and the, ex, the, the work ends 
whatever the last meeting is in December. We're not, this is not a forever committee. It's got a start, a middle, and an end. Go ahead, John. And there's a report out at the end. There's yes. a, a written Something. documentation, some submission to council as the recommendations. Yes, or if they can't read, we'll get a report one way or the other at the end. So um, with that, I, um, anybody have other questions? Move to approve. Move by Stacy. Second. Second by Joe. Um, all any further questions? Seeing that all in favor, signify by raising your hand because Catherine is on Zoom. Thank you. Right. That passes unanimously. Thank you all. The next item, item number nine, is approval of agreement for trail master plan. Richard McLeod. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, as promised, uh, on August eighth of two thousand twenty-two. Um, the PATH Foundation came and did a presentation to you all. Uh, since then, we have been working on a master agreement, which is the overall agreement, and a master plan uh, agreement. Uh, both of these need to be approved. Uh, the total cost shall not exceed $99,480. Uh, it'll take about six to eight months to complete the uh, plan. Um, the expense, expenses for mileage, printing, and shipping will be billed in, in addition to the project as incurred, but those are expected to be uh, minor. Uh, we're, and we're paying for this using the general fund. So I'll take any questions. Okay. I'm looking for hands. Uh, John. Thank you, Richard. Um, as far as the PATH Foundation, they're good at greenways, and that's what I've read. Um, is there, we're spending $100,000. Is there any reason why we're not going out and looking for an RFP or looking at other contracts or looking for other vendor, vendors or bidders? Is there anybody else that can do this work? Go ahead. I can't address, can somebody else do it? But what I can uh, address, Councilman Hennigan, is John Gates and I looked at this question and because of the unique uh, services that are being required for purpose of development, the plan only, they have the staff that provides the exemption under the professional services exception to bid requirements. And so what the master does is just create the opportunity for each stage of development. What you're proving in the master has no consequence financially to the city. It's the actual plan that's the number that's been cited that plan requires you to approve each step along the way, including the proposals, and it's not a plan of construction. As Mr. Gates has said, and I've, I've said, and Richard understands, some components of this later will have to be bid, especially the construction phases. But what you're really doing is you got uh, somebody to oversee those various phases, but the bidding process will be conducted by Mr. Gates and the procurement office for the sub components of this master, if that makes sense. But on just this, because it's oversight, engineering, architectural, landscape engineering, they meet the criteria for a professional services exception. Does that mean others can't can do it? I'm sure they can, but it exempts uh, it exempts the procurement office from any kind of RFQ or RFP. All right, so it sounds like we're going to this starts the process, then we come back and approve various aspects as the plan comes along. Is that what I'm trying yeah, to understand? You, you all, yes, yes, sir. Uh, the, the committee, as it's referred to in here, will help them design the area, but ultimately the city council has to approve the plan at a subsequent meeting, not today. So y'all will get to vote on the ultimate plan. And then you also will get to vote each stage of development of that plan including the bidding and con construction portions of those and other votes later on down range. This just gets it off the ground. Thank you. There's a, there's a memo, there's the master agreement and the professional services agreement. Are we approving the master agreement or the professional services agreement? What are we approving then today in a, in a resolution? The master agreement and the professional services agreement. So well, I if, so we're approving two things. Correct. The master agreement has a five-year contract time. The professional services agreement has a six to eight month agreement. Which one are we approving and what's the difference between the two? The master agreement is for the design of the master plan and 
the construction administration, but that has to come back to you all uh, for another further vote. So once the plan is originated and you all approve it, each segment, they will come back and um, propose to manage it, the construction of that, and we'll have to bring that back to you. It just seems like we're approving apples and oranges when on one side hand, you're giving me, you're, you want me to approve for five years. On the other hand, you want me to approve for six to eight months. I don't understand the difference. So the master plan was the first thing, and that's what you all wanted. Uh, in time in time for a potential bond, bond vote um, on that. Okay. Well, can I answer that? I think maybe I can do it slightly. Microphone on. I think I can answer that slightly uh, better. So the master is sort of an umbrella plan, but it has no uh, monetary compensation. It, it lays out the structure of subcomponents. The, it also says that in section C, if you look below under payment, it says uh, in case of termination of this agreement or any project agreement before the completion of work path will only be paid for work completed as of the date of termination as determined by the city. Essentially, y'all can stop this at any time and just not approve the, the master plan. So it's not a, 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 it's subject to future votes that could renege the whole master plan by never implementing it. And so it does not bind a successor administration or successor council to a multi-year contract. It's simply almost like a subscription oversight that y'all can stop the chain anytime you want to. The only thing you're financially committing to is the second document, the professional services document, to start the development of the, the, the path. If y'all cancel it, if you don't construct it, you, they only get paid for what they've done on the second document. The first is sort of their broad range accompaniment of future agreements will be subject to the structure of that master oversight. So essentially you're, you're hiring a program manager to oversee a big thing that's gonna have subcomponent parts that's intended to probably take at least five years to fully develop out. But at any time you can stop the process. Uh, I hope that answers your question. It does a little bit, yes, thank you. Um, so really we're, the big umbrella is the five-year master agreement. Then you got the professional services agreement is the six to eight months, which has the $100,000 price tag with a bunch of deliverables. <laughs> and those deliverables that I'm seeing has the word um, Greenway Trail all throughout it. And again, Greenway Trails is what the PATH Foundation is very good at doing. Unfortunately for us, Greenway is a hard definition to say that we're going to be able to do here in the city of Dunwoody because, you know, Brook Run Trail through the woods is a Greenway Trail in front of people's single family residential homes may or may not be considered Greenway. One of the things I see missing is the amount of landscaping, trees, and specification. You mentioned, um, Mr. Attorney, the landscaping aspect. I think landscaping is missing on a number of aspects of the professional services agreement. I wish there was more of a landscaping, a greenery, a, a, a trail, you know, landscaping plan. So I know how much shade would be on these to make sure that there's, you know, beautiful walking trails uh, that we are trying to squeeze in. So I'm not seeing that in the professional services agreement. I wish there was more there. Um, uh, Councilman Hagan, can I add one thing? Yeah, please. So article uh, five, section F, that I failed to allude to earlier, the city also can unilaterally terminate this for convenience with 30 days notice. So it's really not a five-year deal. It could last five years, Got but it. you can exercise 30 day notice and terminate it for no reason, just for convenience. As to the content of the scope, I have to defer to Richard, maybe can answer yeah. that. Thank because, you. I'm just, yeah. I didn't mean to put you under the spot, Mr. Attorney, you just mentioned landscaping and personally, I'm not seeing a lot of landscaping in it. Richard. Yeah, um, we discussed it with PATH the last meeting. Um, I think they heard you. Um, it's not specifically mentioned in here, um, but it doesn't mention it in the draft uh, that we currently have in the master plan uh, for trails within the transportation plan. Um, we know what needs to be done. 
we added a paragraph in the master agreement, paragraph M, which states that all master plans shall be approved by the city of Dunwoody. When they are complete, any further agreements or contracts shall be performed under the purchasing policy and shall follow all rules and regulations uh, of the city. So they have to abide by our uh, rules and regulations and uh, landscaping certainly is one of those. Great, thank you very much. That concludes my comments. Joe. Um, thanks, Richard, for putting this together. Um, I believe that there's uh, naming conventions that we're gonna educate. I think it was just last week, last time we met, um, Michael Smith, public works director, kind of gave us a lowdown of definitions and so on. Um, it really is an education of understanding facilities. Uh, for those of you that have seen what Path Foundation have, has done, they have built in urban environments. They have built cycle tracks inside downtown built-in, high built-in areas. They, they have done that. Um, and so the definition of what is a trail, I'm not worried about that. I believe that we're moving forward in the right way of having engagement with the public, uh, better engagement, bringing in all these loose pieces. We've had the, the components here and there and whatnot. Um, and I do appreciate, I'm reading their trail master plan professional services agreement here. And it talks about trail construction standards of the surface material of the bridge options of the tree root bridging trail logo, the at grade crossing details. And, and so we're going to define that right now. We don't have those definitions. So we're going to definitely add a lot more, um, information with this process. Um, you know, Sandy Springs has a master agreement they sign, and it's non-obligatory, right? I, I did my own research on this a few months ago. I got the copy from Sandy Springs, right? That the master service agreement does not obligate us to do anything. It's just, hey, we're going to potentially work with you, maybe. So um, I appreciate moving forward with this, and I look forward to uh, the progress and bringing forth the city's citizens. Hi, Rob. I just want to say I, I'm kind of ex very excited about this. I think uh, it'll be... Uh... You know, the next step towards some really nice amenities for the city that we have uh, kind of laid out and planned for the future. Tom? Yeah, I'll just echo what Rob and, and Joe said. Um, I'm excited to see this come forward. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that we've learned going through is it, is there's, if we have a standard and we have a, a total vision, um, it's much easier to present that to the public um, and get uh, real, real feedback from them. Um, there's a lot of concerns with with trails we have, and I think if if the big bit vision can be seen, you know, and any other, any other thing I like about um, the Path Foundation, I mean, they're they're pretty much the gold standard in in, in the Atlanta region for this type of work, and so not only are they going to work on our trail, but they've also, um, as has been mentioned, they've worked in Sandy Springs. They're currently putting together a, a, a trail plan for Chambly. So our connections to our our neighboring cities. And looking at this in a regional way is important too. And so I think uh, we'll get that added benefit from them. And I, I'm excited to work with them. I think the work based on the conversations we've had and, and what I've read through their contracts, they're going to develop a plan that's consistent with our desires and what we want. Uh, they're not going to just give us what they want. So we will have input as to what it'll look like having trees and lighting and, and where they will go and, and, and what types of amenities we want with that. And um, and having that master vision, I think is important. So I'm, I'm excited to get going with this. Um, anybody else? So um, I want to say that the Path Foundation, I want to be clear, just in case people don't know what a greenway is, a greenway is not a dirt trail necessarily, because it kind of sounds that way to me. It's usually a trail. It can be different things. Some cities put them through parks and call them greenway. Some some cities have a lot of undeveloped space in their downtowns and they green up the space and put a trail, but they've done work in LaGrange, they've done work in downtown Atlanta, they've done work in Columbus that don't look like greenways. And so, but it's the most important part for council and for the citizens in general is to come out and talk about what it is that our expectations are. So that's going to be really important part of this. So um, with that, this is an action item, I believe. Move to approve. Move by Tom. Second. Second by Joe. Any further questions or discussion? Seeing none, I call the question. All in favor, uh, raise your hand because Catherine's on Zoom. All right. Any opposed? Um, that passes 6-1. Thank you um, very much, Richard and everyone else.
The next item is the funding authorization for 2531 Cherry Hill Lane Storm Repairs. Carl Thomas. The pictures of the inside of the pipes. <laughs> Not this time. Oh, okay. <laughs> right. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, the following project is a request for funding for uh, storm repairs on uh, 2531 Cherry Hill Lane. Um, the issue was first uh, identified during the flooding uh, back in August of 2020. Um, we're responding to a flooding call from the property owner and we identified the pipe infrastructure in poor condition. Um, pipe system is about 110 feet, uh, 24 inch CMP. It's approximately 55 years old and CCTV inspection revealed standard deterioration, uh, partially detached head wall, visible holes and deformities in the pipe. And recommended- Aren't those inside of the pipes? Right. That's Those are definitely inside. The okay. <laughs> uh, recommended repairs um, include uh, 110 uh, feet of uh, cured in place pipe, CIPP. Um, the portion at the bottom right is a partially deformed crown of the pipe. Not sure how that happened, if it was during installation or maybe the homeowner was making some private alterations, but we're going to dig out that portion of it and replace it. Um, roughly 20 linear feet of that and stabilize and repair the detached head wall. Um, anytime we have an open cut, we request the contract to give us a 20% contingency. So the estimated cost is uh, 78380 uh, and the 20% contingency is 15, a little over 15K. And the recommendation is for staff to approve uh, $94,056 in funding for stormwater pipes, stormwater pipe repair at Cherry Hill Lane. Any questions? Does anyone have any questions? Move I do. to approve. Oh, oh, move to approve by John. Second. Second by Stacy. All right, I have a question. Yes. Way back at the beginning, you said this was discovered on August 7th, 2020, which is two years and one month ago. Does it always take this time? Were there special scenarios? Um, we have a, a capital project prioritization system mm -hmm. where we basically okay. rank projects by you know, safety conditions, this particular pipe is outside of the right-of-way. So if there was a failure, it would not impact the right-of-way. It wouldn't have a sinkhole in the road. So typically those projects sit in the queue a little bit longer. Okay. And what did, was the homeowner asking intermittently? Were we keeping them informed? Yes. Yes, I was um, speaking to the property owners. Uh, another thing that delayed this particular pro um, project was um, one of the homeowners was reluctant to sign the easement. I was going to say, and we have some of those right across the city where you could do the work and they, the homeowners won't sign the easements. Okay, that's what I thought. All right, thank you. Thank you. Um, there's a motion on the floor. I call the question. All in favor, raise your hand, uh, signifying a, yeah, uh, whatever. Yes. Um, all in favor, anybody opposed, raise your hand. Seeing none, that passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Mr. Thomas. All right. Next, we have Ms. Overton to talk about recycling and a grant. Oh, wait one second. Excuse me, Mayor Privilege. Wait, 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 don't leave. I want to recognize you. We haven't had scouts here in a really long time. And I forgot our protocol because it's been so long. I don't want to embarrass you, but thank you for coming to our meeting. Do you want to tell us what troop you're from? You can come up to the microphone if you don't mind. Sorry. And you can mention what badge you're working on too, if you want. Just um, I'm from troop 477. Right. Okay. And do you, what badge are you working on? communications. Okay, great. Well, thank you for coming. We appreciate all the good work that scouts do in our community. So thank you very much. All right. Now, Ms. Overton. Good job, Dad. He thought he was sneaking out. Good job. Yeah, well, Stacey called it. All righty. So good evening, Mayor. Good, good evening, Council. Um, so before I begin my presentation, I do want to introduce myself. Um, my name is Ashley Overton, and I am servicing the City of Dunwoody's Community Development Department um, as their sustainability planner. So overall, my role in general is to assist the city 
with implementing and supporting their uh, sustainability goals as part of the 2021 um, sustainability plan. <laughs> All right, so um, as mentioned, um, I wanted to present to council today to seek approval for a joint application with the city of Sandy Springs to apply for a grant that will provide um, accessible and affordable um, residential composting opportunities in the city of Dunwoody. Um, through this program here, as mentioned, um, this grant will be a collaborative effort with the city of Dunwoody and Sandy Springs to provide opportunities for residential composting as well as composting education in a perimeter area. Um, the funding source for this grant will be with the Georgia EPD's um, Recycling and Race Reduction Grant um, with an estimated project cost of $15,000 over the course of two years. Um, some of the components included in this project will include accessible and affordable options for composting. Um, for the city of Dunwoody, we are looking at to providing free compost bins for residents of Dunwoody, as well as uh, providing a composting 101 education workshop. Um, this, off, this grant program will also include supporting and maintaining um, regional partnerships, as well as um, support of local community gardens. Some of the project partners that are listed does include um, Keep North Fulton Beautiful, Keep the Cow Beautiful, the Dunwoody Community Garden Orchard, as well as the University of Georgia's um, <laughs> Extinction Office. As mentioned, this project is expected to last over a course of two years. So with this being a grant um, that we're looking to submit our application for, applications will be due by September 30th of 2022, with the Georgia EPD deciding and awarding grants around December 2022 and January 2023. Um, if awarded the grant, the city of Dunwoody and Sandy Springs will begin project planning in January 2023, and then we'll start our sustainability speaker series beginning in February or March, 2023. The importance of the Sustainability Speaker Series is because it will provide the opportunity for participants to learn about proper composting in an urban area, as well as this will be held an opportunity for them to pick up their um, compost bins. Um, throughout the course of March, 2022 to 2025, um, the compost program will presume, and then through, on a semi-annual basis, we would do check-ins and data collection. So next, I would like to um, discuss and share the importance and why this program is important and need and the benefits of it. So in the state of Georgia, food, food residuals of food waste makes up about 12% of the waste that is deposited into landfills per year, with that equating to about 150 pounds per household in the state of Georgia per year. Um, that overall equating to 1.6 billion trash, pounds of trash deposited into Georgia landfills, equating to about $1,500 of food waste per household as well as overall for the state of Georgia, $1.92 billion of food wasted per year for the state of Georgia. Um, so some of the benefits that including them for composting is it reduces our greenhouse gas emissions, promotes healthy soils in our area, supports local and urban agriculture, and reduces residents' exposure to air pollution, thus improving their quality of life. Included in the presentation here is an example of a compost bin that we are looking to provide for free for residents in Dunwoody. Um, a general brief example of how this works is that from the top area, you see that there's an opening available for households to some deposit their food waste. Uh, we will be providing brochures and pamphlets available to educate them what can be compo composted and what cannot. And then as you see there, um, those, that food waste will be deposited. Um, and then over a course of six to eight weeks, they will have compost available to use in their backyard gardens. Each compost bin is an estimated average value of $50 per, per bin with a uh, overall volume of 80 gallons. So they're able to hold 80 gallons with the waste. And then we are looking to purchase 200 for a pilot program to start in the city of Dunwoody. With that, the estimated project cost totals to over the course of two years, $10,000 to purchase 200 compost bins, and then $5,000 will be available for education and outreach. Um, and storage as well for those bins. Um, we will like to note as well that for this grant, a cash match is not required. The city of Dunwoody is looking to submit um, an in-kind match, which would include staff time and volunteers from the um, Dunwoody Community Garden Orchard, as well as the University of Georgia. 
and that is all I have for the presentation. Thank you. All right, questions? I, I have one. So it's really zero cost to the city in terms of dollars or is it $15,000 in city cost? Yes, so um, how the Georgia EPD program, um, their grant program is scheduled, uh, established is that it is going upon a reimbursement model. So we will um, like to have $15,000 available up front. And then upon receipt of the of the compost bin and outreach material, we'll submit our receipts to Georgia EPD and then they'll provide reimbursement within 30 days. Gotcha. So it's a zero cost except for staff time and volunteer time. Okay, yes. thank you. Uh, Rob. So, a um, couple of questions. One, this is one of the big beneficiaries of this would be the the cab department of sanitation but have less yard waste less trash to pick up <clears throat> have we talked to them to see if there's any way to kind of get a multiplier with this program that maybe they'll do something to to support as well or is that something that we could consider just a thought you don't need to answer the question now but so, so um just <laughs> um, one of the ideas that we did um work with was um there's an organization that is actually based out of north carolina and georgia They've worked with the city of Atlanta and a few other communities in um, the metro Atlanta area to provide that um, drop off location to overall reduce the amount of um, food waste that is being delivered. But um, for to start out, we will like to start with the compost bin program initially just to kind of test out our market. And then subsequently after the two year program, we will like to apply for the USDA grant fund program to implement that residential drop off location that would allow us to have a larger market. So working with, um, let's say, renters and other uh, non homeowners in the city, mm -hmm. and then also um, working with the university, hopefully with that. And then this is kind of just a technical question, but when you have um, the folks doing you know, education and training, personal preference, it would be great if somebody talked about Bakashi which is a specific kind of composting that isn't supported by this bin. Mm -hmm. But um, if you get somebody that's really into this, that really likes this program, uh, that's got some benefits. It's anaerobic, so it doesn't have any greenhouse gases that get released. And you can use uh, meat and animal waste in addition to vegetable waste. So meat company. products are not allowed within compost bins in that area, so. <clears throat> well, with yeah. the Bokashi bin, you can do that. Yes, okay. Because it's a sealed bin. But anyway, I, just a, a preference. If this gets approved for for education, um, but obviously you know, I trust the judgment of the team. Um, uh, yeah, just real quick. I know this is a, a joint uh, application we're doing with Sandy Springs. Has Sandy Springs already committed to moving forward with this? Do we know? Okay, so we so it's not contingent on their approval or anything right. like that. Okay, great, thanks. And just to clarify, the arrangement, the partnership that we have with Sandy Springs overall is just to, to submit that joint application. Um, there's no financial commitment or anything like that. And we're also partnering together with education and outreach. Was there any benefit with perhaps increasing the chance of getting the award by partnering with Sandy Springs or is it just the, the staff time being split? Is that? Yes, so um, partnership with the Sandy Springs will provide with extra points in the grant review application process. You were listening last week at that meeting, <laughs> talked about joint part applications. Anybody else? Is consent okay for this? Um, Catherine, did you have any questions? No, thank you. Okay. Um, thank you for bringing this to us. And so this is not the program where somebody picks it up and takes it away and brings you back dirt. Correct. This is, you do it at home and create your own soil. Correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Walker. Thank you, Mayor. So the next agenda item I have tonight is the discussion of the parks master plans for the properties that Burmack Road and Roberts Drive. Matt Wilder is here from Pond and Company to present to you guys uh, our latest draft plan for those parks. So let me tee this up. Is that small for you guys? All right, let's see if I can make it bigger. Yeah, you have to bring it. Yeah, there you go. A little bigger, maybe. How about that? There you go. Hey, good evening. Yeah, I'm Matthew Wilder with Pond. Um, 
principal landscape architect over there. So uh, happy to be here tonight to talk about the, the Vermac and Roberts Drive master plans and answer any questions. I'm going to try and look on the screen, but my eyes aren't great. So I brought a bigger size <laughs> myself to help as well. Um, we're just going to touch base on where we are in the progress schedule, look at some of the um, the open house results, kind of feedback we got from the community, look at the updated plans, touch base on the cost opinions, and end up just talking about the next steps that we have to do. So as we wrap this up in the next, ideally, month. So if you move forward here. Schedule-wise, um, you see what's on the screen. We've had public input last a year ago um, with on-site public meetings, uh, open house in December of 2021, uh, online community open house also in December 2021. Um, since then, there's been master plan efforts and updates, and we are, the last was city council master plan presentation. I'm sorry, the current is this city council master plan presentation that we're doing right now. Um, So historically, uh, you may or may not know, but we started, I guess, um, summer of 2021, I believe it was in July. Uh, we came up with initial concepts for each property that was in October. Hey, Matt, can you do me a favor and maybe get closer to the microphone if at all possible? I'm okay. sorry. See if it, how's that? That's better? Good. I think so. Okay. Um, so we did these initial concepts for each property uh, in October of 2021, so 11 months ago. Um, from that, we got initial feedback and decided to take, or not decided, we took the information from the, the feedback of those two concept plans, mashed them into one, very typical process of what happens. It's kind of rare that somebody says, give me A or give me B. Um, either way, you, you take concepts and ideas from each, put it into one and come back with a draft master plan. That's what was done. Brought those both back in um, December. 2021. Um, the Roberts Drive one, there was a little bit of discussion mainly revolving around the location of the softball field at the time. So there was a interim plan that came out in February of 2022, where we basically flip flopped the site moved the softball field to the north. So that's why on the screen, you can see one extra plan for uh, Roberts Drive. And then here we are today, uh, based on the feedback we got on both of those plans, and I'll sh share some information about uh, we have now updated master plans that, uh, barring any final tweaks, final modifications, would come back to you for final approval in a month or so. Get all this on here. It's a little. There, I think we got it. Um, so we did an online community open house for both of the master plans to say, give us your feedback. Maybe you participated. Um, it was essentially an online mapping tool where anybody could come in and drop data points on the map and tell us a, an idea that they had, something that they liked, something that they disliked. Um, this was not a statistically valid survey. This was not any um, specific format. It was really an open forum anecdotal uh, data. It did not go to every single person in the community. There's, it's, it's really a, we're putting a call out. If you're interested, come give us your feedback. People came, gave us feedback. You can see, you know, we had a few hundred total comments. You can boil those down to, we actually had 115 unique email addresses. So, you know, some people left one comment, some people left multiple comments. Um, we had a lot of people interacting and giving up and down votes on the comments that each other left. So all in all, it was a, you know, a good process, uh, a good amount of feedback. So we are happy with that. Um, and yeah, we'll move on from there. Look at some specific feedback. So on the Vermac Road uh, site, there were 82 total comments on this one. The overarching themes were People were interested mainly in uh, bicycle and pedestrian access, uh, safe crossings, extension of the proposed walking trail. Uh, really was a lot of consensus and desire for a more passive space at this park uh, and generally support uh, overall for the proposed layout of the Vermac Road property. So it, this one was 
Let me say the easier one, I guess. Uh, a little bit of just the breakdown of the, the themes of the, the mentions that we got. Um, a lot of them were, or the majority of comments were just kind of desires to make little minor modifications to specifics that were presented in the plans. Again, a lot of the support was for specific elements or the overall plan. Uh, you can see how it kind of ranked out uh, some of these <clears throat> comments. There were a few people that said too much parking, but clearly there was more support overall for the plan in terms of comments. So uh, this is just a way to kind of get a sense of where people's mindsets were uh, numerically based on the number of comments that we did receive. <clears throat> on the Roberts Drive property, we had a lot more comments, about three times as many comments uh, over there. Again, so that one was the one that was drew more attention. Um, it was really that softball field presence location. So in this plan that you see on the screen right now, it was you know, you know towards the bottom of the screen, south part of the site. Uh, ultimately, it got flipped in that interim February plan, which you'll see on another slide as we go forward here. Um, there were some desires to expand natural and open spaces in this park, uh, and people were also you know, driven by some of the amenities, concerns about traffic, parking, uh, and what might come with the, the, the amenities proposed uh, in this park plan. So took that all into consideration going forward. Same kind of bar chart here, uh, thinking about what were the, you know, where were the most mentions when it came to the feedback that people left us. Um, a desire for more passive natural uh, open spaces was at the top most mentions. Um, there was support for spe many specific plan elements of the plan and the overall plan. Uh, and then right there, you know, in the close third was that uh, concern question about the uh, location or general inclusion of softball uh, in, this in this park plan. Everything else sort of shrunk down from there, but you can see um, some of the, the comments. So here we are now with the, I need to switch to a page where I can actually read. This is the current today Burmac updated master plan that we are bringing forth for everyone's uh, review and comment and hopeful final approval in the near future. So you can see it didn't change significantly if you go back and compare this uh, to, the, to the last plan, took the feedback in, updated it. Um, you can see it's dominated by an open play area, uh, a sensory playground, and the existing, existing vegetated buffer represented by the darker green area, the dash kind of brown line through there is the walking trail. So the upper left, the item number two, if you can see it, maybe small, sorry if you all are you in the room, the upper left rectangle, that's the uh, light green rectangle, that's the open play field. To the right, the yellow vertical lines represents the uh, sensory playground. There's parking in here. There's some pickleball courts. Uh, there is a park office. There's, uh, you know, <clears throat> sorry, restrooms, pavilion, a gazebo. Uh, there's a lot of things, but a very passive, uh, low-key park. That's a very good come to the community, hang out, get some green space, get a touch of nature. Uh, but I also have the opportunity to to uh, play and and enjoy your neighborhood community park. So really switch over here. Um, there's only one real significant change from the prior plan in December to the updated plan today. And that was that we weren't talking about interpretive signage in the original plan and that was a comment. So interpretive signage is now a recommendation and an inclusion in this updated master plan for FERMAC. This one I can read. Um, so we did go and do some parking studies. I'll say, not you, not anybody, most city codes are really great for a Walmart or anywhere else. They do nothing, very often don't do very well telling us how to park parks. And it all is driven by what are the elements that you put in a park. Is it a active park with a lot of baseball fields or a lot of soccer fields and you're going to run tournaments out of it? Is it a passive park with a few amenities, a playground, pickleball courts, walking trails? Um, so it's something hard that codes can't really handle. We come up with uh, good guidelines based on usage and look at uh, other, other references in other places. 
Uh, bottom line is you can kind of see the matrix we put together thinking about the different facilities, um, the, the size of the park, the open play areas, thinking about square footage of some of these. Uh, come up with a number and we were looking at, we recommended 95 parking spaces, but then did a 30% reduction uh, with the idea that you're gonna get biking and walking to this community park. Um, you know, we go to different places and some say we drive everywhere. We must have as many parking spaces as possible. And there are others that say, we want as little parking as possible and we want people to walk, walk, walk and get there. So uh, this was kind of that compromise in between kind of a 70, 30 split. So we recommend 95 we're saying um, really 67 spaces about a 70% or 30% reduction of that recommendation uh, should be a viable amount of parking for the Vermac site. So moving on to the Roberts plan, I'm sure I can read things here. Um, this one is the current plan, uh, not the not the previous February one. And the main difference here is uh, you should notice there is no softball field in this current plan. Um, the first plan that came out, the softball field was towards the bottom of the screen, the bottom of your page. The second was we moved it to the north. The third is we replaced it with a multi-use rectangular athletic sports field. You could play soccer, you could play football, you could play lacrosse, you could play any kind of pickup sports that you want. The idea is that it could be a you know full synthetic turf lighted field. It could be less than that, but the op idea is that it is there um, in the master plan in place of the softball field. Otherwise, most of the amenities that were previously proposed are there. Um, I think it's probably easier if I just jump to the next page and we do have a little bit longer list of the kind of changes that occurred from the 20, the February plan to this plan. So here's where I mentioned, you can see the February plan. The February plan is on the left. Today's plan is there in the middle of the screen and on the right hand side is our summary of changes. Uh, again, the big driver was the removal of that softball field. By removing the softball field, we moved tennis courts around uh, we had tennis and pickleball kind of layered upon one another. Now they are separated, two tennis courts next to four pickleball courts. We had one full court basketball court previously. Now we have one full court and two half court basketball courts. Um, you can see in the bottom of the screen to the, or I guess the middle, parking lots reoriented uh, to make things accommodate, fit and be accommodated. Um, really all the amenities towards the bottom of the screen, the um, the play areas, the open spaces, the restrooms, facilities, uh, they all just sort of shuffled around to, to be accommodated. So uh, really, if you remember the February plan to now, I just reiterate the biggest change was the softball becoming multi-use recreational rectangular field. Um, you know, the site will require grading walls. It's, it's a lot of stuff to push in there um, and the, Again, these are all master plans based on the data at hand. Once you get into the real full on surveying design and engineering, that's when you really suss out and get everything to fit nice and cleanly. Uh, so things will still move around a little bit, but this is the guiding force that says these, this is the programming that should go in generally in these spaces within the property uh, to make it all fit. And then it'll be time to go forward with design and engineering. Uh, same thing on the, as we did with Vermac, uh, Roberts has the calculations for parking. So same idea, went through the matrix, came up with a total recommendation of 135 parking spaces, applied a 30% reduction and said, <clears throat> we can get away with 95 parking spaces uh, and that will be a viable parking lot for the proposed amenities within, within this park. Again, this is not the final final. We're here to take in feedback and comments so that we can get it all buttoned up. So in a month, we can say, this is what we recommend that you go forth with future engineering design and engineering. So it can be actually built for everyone's enjoyment. Uh, everyone's always interested in this and I'll just caveat it with everybody knows between supply chain and everything else going on, prices are all over the maps. Uh, we're watching 
now with inflation reduction plans to see what happens. Will prices start to level, come down? Um, hopefully things will be less erratic. Uh, but right now, when we've most recently priced this, Roberts is coming in in the 9.1, pushing $9.2 million for implementation in the Vermac properties coming in 3.8, almost $3.9 million uh, to implement. And that includes everything, you know, the, that is all of your survey, all of your geotech, all of your design and engineering, all the way through construction administration and all the full construction. So uh, you go from master plan, you have to design everything until the final day that we can rib ribbon cut. Uh, again, all of this, these will change as you get into engineering. We put on large contingencies. The hope is as you tighten it up, uh, it stays, but we cannot control the economy and prices of labor and prices of materials. All we can do is check in and update every three to six months, especially when you're in construction time. Or when you finally go out to bid, contractors lock in prices. Um, but best, best estimates right now, these are the numbers that we are looking at for both of the parks. Um, we did itemize a handful of elements just to give you a sense of where some of the big dollars are going to. Um, I know you all have the full packet that was be able to download and anybody uh, attending the meeting online or here tonight could have downloaded the same packet that has a more detailed line by line estimate in there. But um, you can see the information, but we pulled out a few of these just to give you a sense of where some of the big dollar items are. Um, any project can be phased, absolutely. Um, I will say that if you're gonna phase a project, there are certain decision points that you make. If you say, oh, I wanna put in a splash pad at a later date, well, you certainly need to put in the uh, utilities to be able to hook that splash pad up in the future. You can't come back and tear up a bunch of park uh, to put those utilities in. Uh, you've then wasted money and effort and time and delayed people's access to the park in the future. So um, you might look at something and say, oh, that's a great, let's say, take that number out. But there are still money elements that you're going to spend to make sure that you're set up in the future. Or you make decisions to say, we're taking something out and we will never put it in. We're gonna build the park out. We will not come back and tear up whatever we need to tear up to get to there. Um, so again, there's all kinds of ways to do these. Um, and, and get to that, get to the end game. Uh, I think oftentimes the best you can do is commit to a master plan, commit to funding and move out. The longer you sit and wait on something, the longer it costs. Costs almost always go up. Um, then you ask to redesign and it costs to redesign and then you get the price back and you're like, why does it cost the same now? We have less in the plan because we spent time <laughs> worrying about the cost. Uh, so I'd say you, get the, the will behind it, the, the support behind it, commit to it, put the money behind it, move forward, and you will be happy with your end results and, and it will be the, the best value you can get now, um, unless we just super tank into a massive recession and buy stuff on the cheap. But let's hope we don't do that, right? Let's not do that. Let's not go there. Okay. Oh, sorry. Uh, just one last slide. So next steps, like I said, uh, this is to get any final feedback, open forum, um, I will answer any questions and then the idea is to make hopefully any minor modifications, tweaks to this, button it up, bring it back and say, hey, here's the few tweaks we made. Do you all approve? In October, you can be off to the races with the next steps of going towards financing, engineering, design, future implementation. All right. Thank you very much. Questions? I'll start with Catherine. Comments? Anything? Yeah, I'm going to make a comment about the, the Roberts plan. Councilwoman Harris and I sat down with Brent and we took feedback from our district and, and all the input that we had to come up with essentially what you see in front of you tonight. We, this is a, this is what she and I feel is needed for the district. Brent concurs that these are the right amenities that for us to offer in, uh, in that area. So we three are comfortable that this is the best plan for the Roberts Drive Park. And I appreciate all the effort that went in, all the comments from the constituents, and we look forward to building it. Thank you. Um, I'll start with John. Thank you, Brent. Um, going through the plans, I'm 
start thinking of what do we have in the city and what don't we have in the city. And I want to think of inclusion. I want to think of um, handicap access, wheelchair access. Brent, anywhere in the city, can you tell me where we are on that type of access and inclusion type playground that we have in the city? Is that missing? It seems to me like it might be missing, but maybe I'm wrong. So Wynwood Hollow is uh, fully ADA compliant, has ramps up to the higher platforms. All of our playgrounds are uh, ADA compliant services. That's the minimum standard. So I'm just, I mean, I appreciate right. that. I'm just trying to think, I've been researching and I'm trying to think of what we have and don't have. But at Wynwood Hollow, right? You can push a child or a child can actually roll up Correct. on so the equipment. Typically right. ADA playgrounds meet the requirement by having lower level okay. uh, opportunities uh, on the ground level. Uh, we went one step further at Wynwood Hollow and included ramps up to that second level. Right. So not only are they accessible on the ground level, but also at that second level. Um, the playground at Vermac uh, is taking into account uh, more sensory stuff for children mm -hmm. with autism Correct. and things like that. So it would be another type of, of accessibility that we would provide through that playground. I've heard you mention the sensory you know, playground. What's then at Roberts? What's the plan for that? Uh, we don't have a specific plan for that, but it could be certainly something we would program in if that's what council desires. Uh, it can be done at the master plan level. Go ahead and put it in the plan as a high level ADA accessible sensory playground in the master plan, or it's something we could price during construction documents. And I just want to make sure it's serving all citizens. And I just want to make sure that we're meeting those. I will send you some links as well as council to some playgrounds that I've seen. I just want to make sure that sure. we think from that perspective, okay. if it gets added in, if there's some easy wins. But again, I just want to make sure that we're thinking from that perspective. When I looked at Robert's drive plan, there's a, uh, see, there's, there's a couple of pavilions. Uh, they identify one, but they don't identify the other two brown marks. Those are also pavilions, right? Correct. You're, you're speaking of the ones around the splash pad. Yeah, right. Yeah. And those are small shelters, shade structures for moms, dads, while their kids are hanging out in the splash pad, somewhere to stop, eat lunch, hang out in the shade, get their kids out of the sun for a minute. So they serve more of a purpose. And all those pavilions seem to be in one place. I'm sure we can do other stuff later. I'm not pushing for more, but I just wanted to make sure I understood what those two brown marks were. So thank you. That's it. No, no other questions for me. Can, can, Joe, do you mind if I? So what I'd like to see, John brought it up, is, is it possible at Vermac to make this a state of an art Play, I'm really throwing a wrench here. Sorry, but no, I'm allowed. We're, we're at that level. So, you know, the sensory playground is fantastic, but can we also bring in, similar to what we did at Wynwood Hollow, some equipment that children with other disabilities can use? And can we look at it? I know I was probably, you know, when my second graders told us that our playground equipment was all too babyish. Um, the six through 12 is great, but I'd love for y'all to take a look at. I think there's room at Vermac to do multiple types of equipment, like John is referencing, I think, stop me if I'm putting words in your mouth, there, so that then we can say, we have this playground with a, what do we call the meadow? A meadow that is designed specifically for children uh, with all kinds of disabilities. Sure, we can totally do that. There's also playground equipment for older age children. Yes. Above 12. There's rock climbing walls, there's right. swings, there's lots of other opportunities for other age groups, even above the 12 year age group, if you want us to look at that also. Right. So I think that would be good for Roberts, but I think for and Vermac, whatever you can do that's appropriate for children with lots of different kinds of disabilities, so that when it's built, and there may even be grant funds out there, when we build it, we can say to our community that we are inclusive. I mean, we have Wynwood Hollow and that's fantastic. It's actually a really good playground, but we have this park with these amenities for this community. Sure. So, okay, now Joe. All right, I'm just gonna have some conversation here. Um, you know, the, there's an adage work expands to meet the time allotted and it's sort of like park scope expands to meet the space allotted. Uh, spending $9 million for Roberts Drive, we just spent, I know inflationary issues, but the whole improvements that we did at Brook Run was what, seven plus million. So we're incrementally, I, I think it's it's still quite uh, extensive. I look at this as equity on our west east side of our city as well. It's not a central location for all of Dunwoodians to use, 
uh, to it. Um, I appreciate the reduction because of the idea of not having a drive to draw regional use traffic generator. I appreciate that. Um, I also appreciate kind of lessening the pay to play fields for near exclusive use uh, by a specific age range or a specific use. I really appreciate, and I hope that we also have open play. I know we're not doing programming yet, but will the Roberts, if it goes with this plan, would that have open play, unscheduled time scheduled for that? Absolutely. Multifield? Yes. Okay, thanks. Um, and as far as playgrounds go, <laughs> you know, if thinking out of the box here, there are things that adults can use. Now we don't have them in either one of these parks, but there are kind of cool things that adults can engage with. You see them more than in, in say public spaces in more of a, a built environment on a town square or green, but um, yes, we have children here, but yes, we have empty nesters and we have people here that never had children. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I appreciate the passive use. I know there's play. I know there's fo focus on children, but I'm just being creative here of potentially there, there are these things that adults can engage with as well. Um, even in Alpharetta off of their Greenway, sort of they had some public art, but you can engage in and interact and move around there. So just, you know, tweaking around the edges on that one. Um, I like on Vermac, the, the passive tour, I like being more passive toward the neighborhoods, right? Because you wanna be quieter and having those buffers. Um, when I had the initial conversation with the original consultants way back when with Pond, I, I told them the, um, uh, Atlanta Botanical Gardens. I went over to their place up in Gainesville, brand new, beautiful place. They've got this one children's play area, spent, I don't know, up close to, you know, a couple million dollars just for this. But it was really cool because it was, now I talk about adults, but it was an interactive child's play area where they actually got to move blocks and they could build like a little building, but it was all safe and stuff. But it was really with that cushy, just state of the art, just built a couple of years ago. They had a cool little interactive little bitty splash pad, but it was just really awesome. And I felt like there were spaces for adults in there too, to sit and navigate. Um, just kind of check that out as far as just looking at that. It, I thought it was like, you know, you got a botanical like gardens around the edges, and then you have this peaceful Zen passive area too combined in there. Um, I'd love to get that back at the back end of Permac, that kind of more of a passive place. And if you have more active toward the, the road, um, I'd appreciate that. But and I appreciate the adding for the interactive walking path. Talk to Dunwoody Preservation Trust. This would be something that could be built out from a, you know, just a grassroots effort. Um, it's great over in uh, Tybee Island. They have this trail called the Wanderer Memory Trail. And it's it's a story of this uh, enslaved ship. They, they smuggled over and you walk through each path. And so the idea of having some kind of tie into history, pre-European pre settlers in there, um, and then you can go over across the way, bring field trips, kids from there, and then go over to the, go over to the farmhouse and, and engage and learn about our history. So I, I appreciate that, that's great. Um, back to Roberts, I'm, I've got to go big here. I'll, I'll open the, the box. I'd love to have one day a splash pad in Dunwoody Village. So if we had a splash pad in Dunwoody Village, would we also have a splash pad um, just up the road as well? So I'm just going to leave that in your back. You had thinking here of, I'd love to have a splash pad in Dunwoody Village, sitting around a green, and then people are hanging out, having their food and beverage and entertainment, and that's where our splash pad could be. So uh, anyway, and then the walking, this is phased approach. I get that. Um, the, the, the walking path, if there could be like, a perimeter, I get in like a jog. I don't know how, I know the one area on the south end of Roberts, there's geographic constraint and tight, tight there. Try to make a loop. I know it's only one curb cut and I appreciate that for, for conflict zones, but could you make that a circular loop? Cause then somebody could do a jog and yeah, get in. It may in not a, be as visible, but the, the, the wooden, the brown trail is kind of the path through the trees. And then there's a yellow line that goes. Oh, I see it. Kind of around the basketball course and back across the site. To the now side. would, can it, it go across, like, continue along Roberts in front of the, along the road there? Could I'll, that? I'll talk to Mike. Yeah. Thanks. That's just, you know, yeah, it'd be great. You know, they get a, even crush aggregate or whatever. So people could do a like, nice little jog around there, but, um, um, I'd love to see something come to fruition here. I love the idea of, of phasing it as well, but um, hey, let's uh, put forth um, 
this information. So, oh, by the way, your illustration, you, you mentioned the 65, 67 spaces on Roberts. Um, if you zoom in your parentheses, item, item 15 shows 95 in the verbiage. So just let FYI, I read that. So, and maybe, maybe you can change it to scale. I don't know if that has to be drawn and give some more space. That's getting way in the weeds of tweaking that and giving some more space available to use. Um, so um, let me just triple, triple check here. But yeah, empty nesters, 30, 20, 30 year old without children, um, adult things. Um, yeah, so anyway, thank you all. Thank you. Um, for those of us who are more spatially challenged, the um, Roberts Playground, that's 8,000 square feet, can you compare that to the Brook Run Playground? Oh, in Brook Run's the center uh, playground area. It's the yeah, that main, yeah, yeah, yeah. Main one right in the middle, that's about 8,000 square feet. Okay. So, kind of going with what John and Lynn said, I would love, because we don't really have any in inclus inclusivity at Brook Run, like with a same size playground as Brook Run, we can, we can do better. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we, we just know we can, and I understand that it's not in the plan now, but I think you're hearing from council that we, we have to do better there. Yeah. Um, in terms of the splash pad and ADA accessibility, how does that work? Is it just automatically we make it or how does that work? Yeah. So the it'll all be concrete so it'll be accessible um, from a ground surface material um chris is the one that is we're building at perimeter center east i'm sorry two bridges right two bridges, two bridges. Um, <laughs> all of the spray jets are on the ground there's no overhead or anything like that there's an accessible button that anyone can push and it activates the spray pad and you go in and you can access anyone can access it and this one would be built in a similar fashion uh even the overhead spray pads are fully accessible for people to get under them and all that so um it, it would be ADA compliant and fully accessible and then one thing that i want to point out that already is going to exist at the to be named Roberts Drive Park is that it has a connecting trail to a neighborhood. And so what I would like to see at Vermac is a connecting trail to the neighborhood because otherwise it's just a whole, it, it, it there's something missing and that's what I would like to see. Uh, Rob, you have anything? Yeah, I'm sorry, I was drawing down notes diligently as questions came up. So um, I'll, I'll echo what everyone else has said about inclusivity. I think that's great. Um, and, and I would be in favor of, of uh, especially at the, the Vermac site, making sure we had um, elements for that. Uh, looking at um, parking at Vermac, we have some solar panels. Is there some reason that we did not include a similar um, item at the, at the Roberts Road? Um, I'm thinking back, I think this was kind of a, a pilot thing we were going to try at Vermac to have some solar lighting and potentially solar charging. Uh, on a small scale because it's not cheap to install it. It's a smaller park and so many we could but, do. Not to say we couldn't put it in. I mean, ideally it would pay for itself at some point, right? Yeah. After yeah. six or seven years. I mean, it, <clears throat> to me, that just seems like you, you're giving people covered parking in the summer and also generating electricity. Um, so I think at least for Roberts Road, it would be worth wiring sure. a site for that. Um, and then if it looks like Vermac is working really well, let's add it to, to some of our other parks. Um, <clears throat> kind of just nitpicky stuff. The, the utilities number for Vermac, does that include running sewer lines to the site? I understand that that site is on, um, it's on septic, septic now. It should. Um, really? That seems, that seems a little low. We can go back and, and check that. Yes, and then also that. utilities, but I know for the, the two, Bridges Park, we had an unexpected shower that had to be stuck in to comply with the Cab County regulations. Has that utility and cost been factored into the Roberts Road site? For the splash pad? For the splash pad. The there. numbers that are in this are based on Pond's experience okay. with other yeah, like projects. Just, I know. I, I, yeah, these are ballpark numbers, but it would be nice to make sure. I'm just trying sure, to make sure they're, yeah. they're, you know, we've kind of included all the different factors. Um, I guess the last thing I want to touch on is I can appreciate why we don't have the um, softball fields at the Roberts Road site. Um, I guess this is probably a separate conversation to try to figure out other options um, in the city. And something I think worth talking about at some point is 
we've got all those fields at uh, Brook Run. And if those pitchers' mounds were movable, we could easily switch them back and forth between baseball and softball uses. Um, so just that's a conversation for another day on the side. But I, I would like us to at least be thinking about a way to accommodate that use within the city. Um, I do like the fact that we're, you know, we're using some of the site at Roberts Road to add a little bit more basketball, you know, a few more kind of pickup activities um, and space for that. I think that the, there's definitely a demand for that kind of um, recreational facility. Um, and that's all I've got right now. Tom. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I generally agree with everything that's been said uh, prior, so I won't rehash what's been what's been said. Um, I will focus on something that hasn't been talked about instead. Um, <laughs> Excuse me. My my biggest, um, I guess, concern or ask would be uh, on the Roberts Park. Um, I know, I, I trust, um, you know, Catherine and Stacy have done their homework and their feedback with their with the neighbors and, and the amenities, and and I trust they've got what what's going to make the neighbors happy there. Uh, but but the the multi use field itself, um, I'm a little concerned that the dimensions of that are too small. That we're we're boxing ourselves in and and probably immediately after we build it, or we're going to regret that because it's it's not even regulation high school uh, size. Um, and I think if we build the field to the 300 by 150 dimension, I had a whole bunch of diagrams and maps and everything, and I left them sitting on my desk. So I'm going to be going by memory with some of these numbers. So please verify them. But I believe the minimum size for a high school field is 300 by 165. Uh, and this field proposed field is 300 by 150. Oh, there we go. Look at that. <laughs> uh, so my memory was right. So 300 by 165. So um, and just for, again, size and perspective, the fields of Brook Run are uh, 225 by 360 uh, inside the lines, 245 by 380 in general. So um, I think if we go too small, we're going to we're like I said, I think we're going to regret it. It's going to limit us a lacrosse field slightly larger. I believe is like uh, so lacrosse field is 330 by 165. So it's really just an extra 15 feet in width. Um, if we want to accommodate the lacrosse, we got to find an extra 30 feet, maybe 15 feet on each side. So it's not going massively larger. I think that, and, and I think the other thing that that does as well is that gives us the option if we wanted to do a U10 soccer by adding that extra 15 feet, it gives us the ability to put two fields side by side, which you would not be able to do at 150 because 165 feet is the minimum length of a U10 soccer field. So just an extra 15 feet gives us a lot more programmability of it. Not that we're looking to program it, but it gives us a lot more uses, a lot more flexibility. And I really think that if we don't find that extra 15 feet in width at a minimum, we're going to really regret it because we we won't have the, it won't, like I said, it won't even be a regulation high school uh, size field. So I would ask that we consider, I know that might involve shifting or maybe losing one of the half courts, adjusting the tennis courts a little bit. Um, but um, my ask would be at the very minimum, add that extra 15 feet in width. And if we could find the extra 30 feet in length uh, to accommodate the lacrosse as well, uh, that would be my, my personal preference. Um, and I think that's it. Thanks. Thank you. Um, and I have, so I did my comments after John did about what I think our vision could be for Vermac, which is fully inclusive. And that would include, you know, they have swings that adult, disabled adults can use and regular, I mean, people who are not disabled can also sit in them. And so I think it would be interesting to come back with a plan. I don't, I'd like to really understand the numbers behind covered parking while I'm all about solar. I'm not really sure that if it costs a lot to put the parking in, that that's an amenity that we have to have. And so I'd like to understand the numbers before our next meeting about the covered parking um, and, and potentially the payback. But in general, whether or not we ought to put covered parking at a park simply to accommodate solar is worth discussing, I think, but I need to understand the numbers. Um, I see you're preserving the old home. Is that correct? The older, right. the original home, I guess, which I love the idea of preserving. As long as it doesn't cost more to preserve it than it would to not in terms of office space for parks department. Yeah, so it's in good shape. Yeah. And so 
the septic issue is huge and it was going to be a million something. So I'd be pleased if it was included in these numbers, but I'm betting it's not. Um, and I want, um, I'd like to make sure that if we keep the original house, that the porch is accessible, that we put rocking chairs on the porch. And I think there's a patio on the back as well, just to make it feel like the public can use it and not just as an office that's sort of sealed off. Um, I, I think the public ought to have some value from it if we're keeping it. All right, that was, and so, and for Vermac, I think that was kind of my only feedback um, at the moment anyway. So on to Roberts, okay. So if we don't have a big field, why are we having a concession stand? Um, so the, the large field in the north is artificial turf with lights. If you wanted to have the opportunity to host any program sports up there, it would be there. Mm -hmm. This concession stand wouldn't be in the same vein as what's at the baseball fields at Brookrun or soccer. It's primarily just a serving window with electrical inside of it. So it's very low end concessions, a place to bend if we needed it. So the field that Tom was talking about is number eight on here. Is that what you're talking about or no? Yes. That, the multi-use field. Multi okay. Space. All right. So if I think there's a lot of amenities at this park, and I think that's good, but I wonder, I'm just throwing this out here, if we ought to have a little fewer amenities and a, like have maybe one one basketball I just don't know I don't know for certain that we need to have all these amenities in a community that is accessible by those who live right there but it's not accessible it's not in a very densely populated area um, and I know there's desire for passive space from the neighbors and some of the community and so um, but I wouldn't necessarily do a concession stand if it's costing anything extra because I would just let people bring a folding table and sell their candy and drinks off the folding table. Um, and just the nature of Tom's comment with mm -hmm. the enlarging of that field, it may require us to remove some of the, or reduce the number of the certain amenities. The, the tennis court certainly would be impacted by right. that. The basketball courts could be impacted by that. So just by the nature of that is where the programming needs to go mm -hmm. is to, if the importance is to make the field bigger, over the other types of amenities that will just happen with the redesign. So I have a question for Catherine or Stacy. Catherine, so do we, we know that tennis is very popular in Dunwoody. We also know that most of the neighborhoods surrounded by the park are served by neighborhood swim tennises. But how do we know that we should have two tennis courts and four pickleball courts rather than say six pickleball courts and one tennis court? or no tennis courts and eight pickleball courts? I legit don't know. Well, I, I think we can certainly make the case that tennis teams in this district have run out of courts. You know, um, teams will play and we'll be begging for space. It's, you know, it's a calculation. I, I think the, for me, the value of pickleball is higher because the, it's the lowest barrier to entry. Kids can play, older people can play. Nobody needs a lesson. You don't need to be super sporty. So for me, that's a that's a bigger draw, but I think both will be uh, popular and used. And let me make a comment on the field because we did have this discussion about what regulation size or going smaller. The big pushback that we got from the original plan on this was it wasn't a park, it was a sports complex. So we deliberately worked on the size of that field to ensure that it wouldn't be the high school field. It wasn't going to be that. It was just going to be a smaller version. It required less parking. It, you know, it wouldn't need the biggest and best to be, you know, high school caliber. So that was the calculation for both those items. This is, this is my observation is, is that this is a sports facility, this park. It's pretty well pro it's really full so if we want you know are we better off having fewer other amenities and a larger field or or the amenities we have in a smaller field I don't totally know the answer and that's going to be a 
I guess, a decision we need to continue to talk about, Stacey, do you have something to say? And I will say um, one reason why that we wanted to add the two half courts and the full-size basketball court is if you look around, one, Pernestal, it's busy all the time, and two, if you look al- around any cul-de-sac in this area of town, there's generally a basketball court in the, in the cul-de-sac. So we felt like, y- yes, it's not as dense, but it is going to be used just as much as what we've seen down at Pernishall. And with the two half courts, because it might be a little bit different caliber of a player, we felt that was important. Um, the two tennis courts, you know, like you said, it, 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 tennis is a popular sport in the city of Dunwoody. We have two public courts on Maybe the four. other side of town. We have four. four. Um, and none on this side of town. So we felt like in the making things a little bit more equitable to tennis courts, you know, it, it's, it's not a tennis complex, it's two tennis courts. So that's kind of how we got to that happy place with the four pickleball and the two tennis courts. We did also question the concession stand and we heard the same explanation from Brent. Um, you know, we can look at that and, and take it or not. Um, so one of the things that I think about is, is that on any given weekend, summer day, some weeknights, there are groups of teenagers and preteens hanging out at the village with nothing to do, nothing to do. They hang out in Walgreens and public still. And so I want to make sure that the amenities we have, like, I'm not sure you should do a little kid. I mean, I don't know what the, because we have Dunwoody, Dunwoody Nature Center has a fantastic little kid playground right there. So maybe we need to look at for this playground equipment specifically for older kids, because literally the nature center is right there with its great playground. But I, what I want is the particularly, well, all the kids not to have to hang out in the village with nothing to do, but I want them to view this space as an alternate, alternate hangout place. I would just say that if we're putting in the splash pad, you have to have some playground equipment for small children yeah, you too. You, you just have right. to. You're right. Yeah. And also, which leads to another question, which is, is, is this the best place in Dunwoody to put a splash pad? Second splash pad, right? Because we're doing one here. So, yeah, well, the, that's separate too. That The splash pad at, at this property came out of the conversation of what was still going to be programmed at Brook Run. Was that, because in that master plan, there is a splash pad at Brook Run. That there was a lot of conversation about having one on the northern side of town, having one potentially in the southern part of town, and then having right. one in the perimeter area. And then the conversation turned towards that work run may potentially be over programmed in the master plan, and that we are pretty satisfied with the use of what we have now, a couple of other additions, uh, bathroom facilities and pavilions. But for the most part, parking is a premium there on Saturday. We have lots of programming there that takes up a lot of the passive space already. So if we were going to do a splash pad in a city park, the property at Robert's Drive is large enough to be able to have that amenity and park it and, and still have other park amenities. But certainly if that's something that y'all don't feel strongly about, it is a high dollar item. It is a big ticket item in the plan. Um, to, not, to Matt's right. point, it could be phased in later if it's something that y'all want to do. I do want, come to fruition I do want to say that like in Swanee, there's no playground equipment by their place, best pads. So it's not unheard of in, in Alpharetta, in downtown Alpharetta, there's a splash pad and no playground. So there's it's not unheard of to have the splash pad itself be the destination and then focus on unique playground equipment for older children. You could have like a little swing set or something if you wanted to for little kids, but maybe rethink what a playground is going to be in this space, just like I want you to rethink the Vermac playground to be inclusive. Um, because again, people do just go to the splash pad that can be their destination so that's my take on it and I think we're probably clear as mud the seven of us today so I I Eric do we need to like give them guidance on the trail does there need to be something I mean, not the trail sorry on the on the field thank you word finding skills yes I mean on the field yes definitely be good to have some guidance on that. I mean, otherwise they've made a bunch of notes tonight. I've noticed Brent. Right. You know, have made a lot of notes on any improvements y'all have talked about to the park. But yes, the field, I mean, that that's a um there's been some good discussion on that. And it's also a topic that it's like anything in life. If you build it incorrectly to start with, you suffer with it for many years on that. 
as well. So that's just something you have to um, make that decision and where that space comes from, how much it can be moved around, if that's a desire that you have. Anytime it's made, anything you make bigger, you can always split it too and get more activities if you have more youth activities. So there's, there's really no disadvantage when the land allows to have it larger. Um, and so that's something that, you know, from a staff standpoint, we certainly would um, appreciate, but y'all had to be comfortable with what fits in with the neighborhood, what fits in with that park and that location. Okay, so I think I need to ask for some big other feedback on the field size. Would that help? Yes. John. Let me ask the question. As far as the field goes, um, what if it was the maximum size, but only half? In other words, a half, the maximum field, whatever the maximum field is, but make it a half of that. Does that fit in that space? It fits in that space, but you couldn't use it for a game. It would only be a practice facility. And maybe that's the right amenity. I'm no, I'm just asking the question. What does that field right there? Is it a half size? Does it fit a max? Does it fit a half size? Width. So yeah. So the if you added the 15 feet to the width, that yeah. would allow you to split it in half, and you 10 and under would be able to use. We'd have two fields. Okay. To fit you 10 and under, um, at its if you U11 and up would be able to use the full field. It would just be one game, one use at that time for U11 and up uh, at 300 by 165. I'm just starting the conversation by splitting the baby. So I'm just trying to figure out what's, sure. what's available and what's and not. One thing that we've talked about too, and, and Catherine and Stacey and I talked about was programming. You know, we control what use there is. We control who uses it, when they use it and how it's used. Um, certainly Brook Run has Rush Union, has the school program using it. Uh, we have a lot of organized programs, youth athletic associations that use that field, and we rent it out quite a bit. If the concern is the type of use that goes on in that field, you can build it and have a, a, a very usable facility, but you get to dictate the terms of that. So if you only want it to be for practice or you only want it to be for certain age groups or if you only want it to be used certain days by organized play all that can be controlled through the department so we can create those rules around the facility also but you can't uh, it's very difficult to go back and make the field bigger it's very difficult to redesign and rebuild it later and it'd be cost effective so my recommendation would be build it to the size that you would need for the age groups that we have that need space and then control the use of it through departmental rules, rentals. Um, we don't have to necessarily give a usage agreement to an athletic association for this field like we do uh, at Brook Run and the baseball fields and things like that. All of that can be controlled by whatever policies and procedures y'all want to see for the facility. Joe. Uh -huh. Brent, in the, the splash plant pad that they have in Roswell, right on the river there, um, which was put in maybe in the last 10 years, they, they pay for that. I mean, there's a charge, a fee. Right. So if you have a charge and you have to pay for some, is that run by their city or is that outsourced? Do you happen to know? Uh, my understanding is it's run by the city of Roswell. Right. And they do charge. And they have a splash pad attendant there and there's right. salaries paid for that. And do you know what we're, we what would our operating model look like potentially? It would be a free splash pad. Right. It would be open to the public. It would be free. Right. Okay. All right. On the subject of the field. Um. I think I'm with Tom. I would like to see it sized to a usable size. Um, I'll make a couple observations in, in conjunction with that. If you have to shift and move things around, I think getting rid of the one of the half court basketball courts is a smarter move. If you want to have an all the team, for example, you have to have two courts. Two courts is kind of the minimal minimal amount to, to have a tennis team to have that for that kind of activity. So I think you don't want to reduce that number. Um, and then, you know, the, to the concern that this is going to be too overly programmed, to me, a big open field is visually makes the park feel very open and not overly programmed to me. So uh, I think that that serves back to your point that we can decide independently with that space how we want to use it and how much we want to use it for program activities versus little kids, you know, playing soccer or, you know, teenagers playing Frisbee or whatever out there. Um, so anyway, that's just my, my thoughts on the field. I would be interested in expanding it to the 15 feet, but not to the 30, simply because I don't actually want to lose anything. So my question to you guys is, 
do we have to lose stuff at 15 or can you compress and rejig a little? We can certainly with just expanding it 15 feet, there's a, there's a low area to shift the tennis courts south. Um, you know, the, it's going to get tight with that half court basketball court uh, there because uh, we also have to have areas of egress through the amenities and things like that. We can't put the field line right up against the basketball court without having fencing and all those kind of things too. So um, the one concern with making it longer um, is the field is right there at the edge of that drop off. So it could potentially get into some expensive walls if you make it too long. If you go much longer than 300, you could get into some substantial wall mark and that drives the cost up. So um, we could certainly have Pond look at it to see what the maximum would be without having to get into very expensive walls and a lot of grading and things like that or impacting the amenities too much if that's the direction I want to take. So maybe what we should do is not wait to talk about this till October 10th again and have, if you can, without too much trouble, come back with the three versions of the multipurpose field, the current, the 15, and the 30. Is that right? Is it, or, so there's, well, yeah, the, I guess the third version would still have the extra 15 feet in width or just add 30 feet in length, so 15 feet to either side. But as you, as you pointed out, that if it gets complicated in walls, I'm, you know, I understand yeah, that. I think your parking there has 97, so you're going to have 60. 95, you're going to have 67. So you, that's going to squish. You can shift. I think you may get some room just by moving the, because you got a visualization already there for 95 spaces of parking. Did you count? I mean, I'm asking, no, 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 because I'm wondering if that's right or if it's the 60 something, whatever you said, the reduction. That's what I don't know. So the just, illustration shows how many. Does the illustration show 90 something? What? How many parking spaces did we say there they needed? It should be 67 at Vermac and 95 at Roberts. So it's 95 at this one. I thought you were going to 67 here. That's Vermac. Vermac is 67. Oh. Okay. Um, so I'm okay if you take away a half, one of the half basketball courts. Um, the thing with all these amenities is, is that once school starts, especially here, the basketball courts are probably not used. I mean, we just have to do the best we can with the space we have afforded to us. And so part of what council will have to decide is when you bring back, so right. So when you bring it back, do it realistically, don't come back and squeeze it in. And then when we go to vote, say, wait, we really didn't mean you could have X, Y, Z and that. So show us what is gonna be sacrificed or changed for this, if for the two different sizes. Sure, we'll show you. Is that okay with everybody on council? So is that a good strategy? We have a 300 by 150 foot field. One option is a 300 by 165 foot field and the impact it would have on the other amenities. And the third would be a 330 by 165 field and what that would have on impact on the amenities. Right. So we're getting close. Right. Very close. And Very then close. did we ever look at, and it's okay, never mind. All right. I don't think we need the concession stand. I don't know how much it cost. I'm not a fan. I'm one voice and one vote, but the cover parking at Burmac, I sure would like to see the numbers on that and understand the payoff. And I'm all about solar, but the payoff on that, um, because it seems a little strange amenity to put it apart in the middle of a neighborhood. Actually, one, one comment on the concession stand: if it's if it's built properly, and if you're just if you're not talking about putting your um, you know utensils, right. I'm not utensils, uh, appliances and stuff in there. <laughs> Um, and just out, outlets and stuff like that in the counter, what it could be used for is a storage facility um, and would have value there, but gives us the flexibility if at any point we wanted to have a concession or a, available, it, it would give us that flexibility. So, I mean, again, it, it would, what would be the cost addition? I don't know. Right. Uh, you know, if it's exceedingly more expensive, no, but again, you, we're never... Um, there's never too much storage at these areas either. And on playground equipment for Roberts, I really would like to see some modeling done with equipment that would at least potentially entertain some of the older children who really don't have anywhere to go. 
Yes. Well, you too, but I mean, it could be. And so there's probably room to do some little kit equipment if we feel like we need to, though there's another playground right there at Dunway Nature Center, but potentially with the, um, some little kit equipment, but some different kind of big kit stuff. Not to throw a complete curveball in, but on that same line, I don't know what the cost is, the feasibility of sneaking in like a little nine hole miniature golf course. That might be something that teens might do, right? Mm. I, I don't I don't know if that's a good or bad idea. How much space does that take? Well, I mean, you could actually do that maybe along John, the John, John said free, free Wi Fi. Wi-Fi. Right. Which is okay. A comfortable pavilion and free Wi Fi will keep them out of Walgreens. I'm trying to think of something that teams would actually go and do. And right. Non hole golf might be a problem. <laughs> Not golf, golf, but mini golf. Mini golf. Putt -putt? Yeah, putt -putt. Yeah. I mean, again, it, it's squeezing another minute in. No, but could golf. we do it instead of a playground? Or no. most of a playground? No. No. You you could, uh, one option, and I'll throw this out there, is you might could do some disc golf baskets oh. through the site that are- Kids like, like disc golf. So you, instead of mini golf, a disc yeah. golf is easier just to bring it. Yeah, they can bring their own stuff. Okay. And so that, that could be something right. you could put along the trail. Right? Okay. Okay. Um, all right. So I think in for Vermac, we understand that we'd like to see it reimagined as a place that's really inclusive. Um, so, and that can include like the exercise equipment for adults that Joe's talking about too, if, if there's a place for that. All right, and trees, we could use to plant a few trees at Vermac. There's no shade. All right, thank you. Yes, thank you. Anybody else? Catherine, did you have anything else? Okay. I have one, one more comment. Okay. Oh, sorry. Rob has a comment. That's okay. Not really, this is more directed at the, the idea of covered solar parking. Uh, to me, parking lots are an ideal place for solar because you already have an impervious location. Right. And ideally, your solar pays for itself. There's a return on it. Right. After six or seven years, you start generating electricity and making a profit. So I'm all for it if the numbers make the sense. I look forward to seeing the numbers. Okay. So I think we should see you back before October 10th, or we should change the goal of voting on this on October 10th, but I can't remember how it plays into the Capitol Committee. So let's, if we can do it, if it's not too impossible, because we have both meetings in sep no, this is our September 1st meeting. If we can see you back in two weeks, that would be really helpful. It doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to be an estimation if that's at all realistic. And the Vermac thing, we're not actually telling you how to design it or anything. We're just saying the kind of equipment we'd like to see. Yeah, we can pull examples. Yeah. The variety. I mean, there's so much stuff out there now for playgrounds. Right. Yeah, that shouldn't be hard. So thank you. Sure. And we'll see you again in two weeks, I hope. Thank you. Okay. Um, city manager comments. Anything, Eric? Oh, wait, public comments. I'm so sorry. Uh, public comments will have three minutes. Hey, Mr. Hickey, if you haven't already done another card afterwards, can you do another card, please? Or I can just mark twice on here, Sharon. I'll just mark twice. Don't worry about it. Save the card. Uh, go ahead. You'll have three minutes. Mayor Council, I appreciate your indulgence. Let me speak again. My name again is Bob Hickey. I've been a resident here for 45 plus years. I have one question relative to item number eight on the agenda tonight. The resolution creating the capital advisory capital committee. Uh, my question is, I don't remember, re I can't recall reading the resolution before I came, but I want to understand that that resolution gave them marching orders to have public comments in that meeting, because I think that's very desirable to do so. And if that's the case, my question then becomes, why is that different than public comments in the budget committee meeting tomorrow to where at the current current time, there is no provision for public comments in the budget committee meeting. I've been to previous budget committee meetings with Councilman, Councilman uh, Hennigan, and uh, I, we had public comments then. I don't understand why we don't have them tomorrow and Thursday if it continues on. Uh, my second line of thinking, my second line of comments rel is relative to the park concepts. I've been around a long time in the city of Dunwoody, and I've heard discussions that the what was referred to as the old older building, the old school older building within the Vermac Park, could well be the most historically old building in the city because it was a public school. It was the original one of the original public schools in Dunwoody, 
So my question is, why isn't it treated such, okay? It's probably older than the Donaldson Banneker farmhouse. And so we should treat it with the old respect that we treat the other building. And then my last comment is on <clears throat> the Roberts Road property. I'm very disturbed, very disappointed. Maybe that's the wrong word, very disappointed that we went the opposite direction on the softball field, okay? Uh, we eliminated the softball field. The city spent five to seven million bucks building two baseball fields over uh, near, near Brook Run. And that's for men, okay? Boys, they, they play baseball. Girls don't get to play baseball, or don't play baseball. Girls play softball, okay? And with the elimination of the softball from any of the city parks, <clears throat> I can tell you in my family, it ain't gonna get much support, okay? So we're, 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 the city has become the biggest sexist organization nearby, okay? You're treating girls very different than you treated these boys. And that's a sad state of affairs. So thank you very much. Thank you. And um, city manager comments. Oh, Mayor, thank you. Um, we do not need an executive session tonight, and that concludes our, our business with staff. Okay. Uh, council comments? Anybody? Okay. Catherine? So I appreciate you, Mr. Hickey, for reminding me about the base softball field. So I want to give Eric and our, so two softball fields were going to be very challenging on the Vermac property, correct, Stacy? I mean, Robert's property, impossible in Vermac. Is that correct? And we want to do two. And so we have given staff marching orders to figure this out, to find a way for us to locate property, to put two softball fields, or for Rob's suggestion, look at how we can share the Brook Run facility. So those are our marching orders. So thank you for the reminder. Um, with that, I need, oh, and then I wanted to do some thank yous first. I left my piece of paper upstairs, but I wanted to thank first and foremost the Dunwoody Police Department for their outstanding response to an incident on 285 last week with a truck that caught on fire because a car cut them off, I think, or ran into them. And then it caused a series of other accidents um, and caused the interstate to shut down and destroyed rush hour. Um, and our police were on the scene to, to decab fire for getting the fire under control quickly. And to the Georgia Department of Transportation, to the crews who worked overnight for multiple nights and allowed us to open most of the bridge immediately um, and then came back night after night to make the final repairs. Um, Georgia Department of Transportation likes to thank me for my patience when we're, as we deal with the construction projects that exist. And I'm pleased to announce, whether I'm patient or not, they're going to continue their construction work, but they did open the eastbound ramp on Ashford Dunwoody Road over the weekend, actually a few days ahead of, of what they had told me it would happen, which means you no longer have like this much space to merge on to 285 um, as you, if you're using that ramp to go east. So that is open and the Shambly Dunwoody ramp, which is actually, the construction is not related to the Shambly Dunwoody ramp. It's actually related to the Ashford Dunwoody entrance there is underway, but should be completed, I think, in the next few weeks. So that's all good. All right. Anybody else? Seeing none, I need a motion. Move, Move to adjourn. adjourn. Uh, second. Moved by Tom. Second by Stacy. All in favor, raise your hand. This meeting stands adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.